Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We are starting a brand new series today. I'm really excited about it. This series is called Reconstructing Faith. Reconstructing faith. Today, in society, there's a word, it's a buzzword, it's really popular, maybe you've heard about it. People are doing something called deconstruction. Have you heard that? Deconstruction. They're looking at everything that they've been taught as a kid, the way that they were raised, their values, society. They're looking at it saying, I want to deconstruct this thing, and I want to see what I actually believe, or if I have any belief at all. Deconstruction, deconstructing ideas that they were taught when they were, a chi- when they were a child. And today, there's a lot of people who are doing that with their faith, with what they believe. Do I still believe what my parents taught me? Do I still believe Pentecostalism? Do I still believe charismatic? Do I still believe like a Baptist? Do I still believe these things? Our key text for this series is going to be out of Jeremiah 1 verse 9 and 10. It says, then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build up and to plant. See, God has given us power, one with our words. We can build each other up or we can tear each other down. But he's also given us the power to look at what we believe, look at our faith, look at the things that are around us and say, this doesn't really fit the way that my life is going or, or, the, or the way the word of God says. Maybe I need to dismantle these parts of my life and maybe I need to build some more wholesome different habits or activities in my life. God is telling Jeremiah that he has the power and the authority to construct and deconstruct. But then that gives us a question, then to to what end? How far do we go with deconstruction? How far do we question what we believe? Do we completely demolish everything and tear up the foundation and every single thing we've been taught? Or do we realize that maybe there's just some things that need to be remodeled? Come on, we're talking about our faith. We're talking about our belief in Jesus. We're talking about Christianity. And I'm going to say that maybe we need to leave the foundation in place. Because there is a difference between demolition and deconstruction. Demolition is bringing in the wrecking ball and destroying everything you've ever been taught. It's all a lie. No, it's not all a lie. Maybe you had some lies. Maybe you were deceived in some things. But it's not all a lie. Deconstruction says, let's pull some things apart. Let's see what we have to work with. Let's see what's valuable. That way we can put it back in its proper place in our belief system. As we jump in, let's just take a moment and pray. Father, I thank you for your word that it is alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than the two-edged sword. I pray, God, today that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, Show us things to come. Speak to hearts. Let me speak in a way that brings life to those who hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a kid, I was very frustrating to my parents. Anybody frustrating to your parents? Yeah, I was very frustrating to my parents. On Christmas Day, I was so excited about my gifts. It was what I always wanted. And I was so excited to open them. And I had to rip into those packages. And I was, yeah, I got a remote control car. I was huge into RC cars, like big time. I knew how to put them all together. I knew how to solder all the wires, the servos, the battery packs. There used to be this spot in Phillipsport towards Ellenville where we would have an indoor RC car race. And I wasn't good at racing them, but I was like the pit guy, so I'd fix them. And so my parents would buy me like a brand new RC car, and I'd be playing with it. But by the end of the day, I had that car in pieces all over the floor. And my mom or my dad, they'd walk in like, what did you just do? Why do you break all your toys? I said, it's not broken. They're looking at me. It's in every piece that possibly could be broken. It's not broken, though. I took it apart. Why? Why on earth 
Would you take apart your toys? Was it broken? Did it not work the way you wanted to? No, it was perfectly fine. Why would you do something like that? Well, I wanted to see how it worked. I wanted to see how the gears worked and how they interlocked. And if I change the gear ratio, I can make the car faster. I'm just going to throw this out there. If you have a kid that takes his toys apart, put him to engineering school. Like, that's how his mind works. That's, or his, her mind works. I should have probably been an engineer, right? Like, I can take just about anything apart and put it back together, and then all of a sudden it just works. But it's frustrating to people who build things and then watch you take apart what they build. It's frustrating to people who buy you a brand new toy just to watch you take it apart. You see, there, there is an enemy to deconstruction, and it's the people who first built it. The people who don't understand, why would you question anything? Why wouldn't you just believe what someone tells you? Why, don't, why wouldn't you just read a scripture and just take it at value and, and, and just take it as it is? Why would you question it? Well, because that's how my mind works. I need to see how it works. I need to see how the Old Testament and the New Testament intertwine and work together and how the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, how prophecy is fulfilled in the New Testament, but then it was said in Ezekiel back in the Old Testament. I'm like, wow, I can see how it works. And when I can see how it works, I can understand it, I can believe it, I can implement it. But there are people who are deconstructing not to figure out how it works, but just to kind of just be done with it. There are some people in here who have been deconverted. There are some people who are deconstructing. There's people who are discontented with church. I just, I'm just not into it anymore. I mean, I was about to say 9-11, but the pandemic was like the biggest stop for a lot of people in their Christian walk. It became the perfect excuse to not go back to church because they were already discontented with what church was. They just stopped. And maybe they're not deconverted, but they're definitely now dechurched. Come on, somebody. This sermon today is a simple introduction to deconstruction or reconstructing our faith. We're going to talk about this for a month and, month and a half. Different voices. We're going to do a panel next week where there's going to be four or five of us having a discussion about some hot topics about our faith and, and maybe some different viewpoints of how to look at it. But I want to give you a few examples or some statements of what people say deconstruction is. Here, here's three definitions. For some, it simply means clearing up out some unbiblical clutter that has been added to the faith by popular American Christianity. Okay, so like, I was raised in a belief system called the word of faith. The word of faith was great. We believed that we could name it and claim it. We can, our confession was strong, but then it went to everybody needs to own a jet. It went too far. You get what I'm saying? We need to clear up some of that clutter. We need to clear some of that up. Like we, we, we were believing in prosperity just for prosperity's sake. Come on. Right, so, so someone needs to deconstruct that sometime. Like, all right, maybe we went a little too far here. Let's clean some of that up. Maybe we didn't go far enough in reaching the lost. Maybe we got so, so focused on building big churches that we forgot to build God's kingdom. The second deconstruction, for some it means tearing down their faith completely and rebuilding their life completely apart from historic biblical faith. I know what they said, I know what the Bible says, but here's what I feel about my life. I don't think I have to or I need to attend church to be a good Christian because after all, it's just about a relationship with God. Yet the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as become the custom of some. But join together with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, building each other up, right? So, like, I get it, and you could probably do that, but that's not what the Scripture says for us to do. For some, it means questioning everything and looking for answers outside of the faith, outside of the Christian faith. 
I now worship the God of the cool breeze. The cool breeze that runs across the fields, that's who I worship. All right, we need to be careful. And it's hard to talk about the idea of deconstruction. And for those of you that have never heard about this, maybe, maybe we should pay attention to what we're hearing and, and what's happening. It's hard for us to talk about it unless we clarify the definition by which we're discussing. But here's the only statement that I want to make about the definition. Any deconstruction, put this up on screen, any deconstruction that is more concerned with cultural acceptance and defining absolute truth outside of Scripture is dangerous and demonic. It's dangerous and demonic. Now, hear me. Hear what I'm trying to say here. I am not a Calvinist, okay? So I am not a solo scriptura. Solo scriptura means scripture alone. I, that, that is not me. I believe that we can cre uh, obtain information that is beneficial to our lives outside of scripture as well. But if scripture is not the foundation that we're building this upon, we're on sand at best. I'm building it on the word of God, but then I can hear something about history, about the way that society was at that time, that scripture doesn't tell me, but a historian can add to that. And that's, oh man, that clarifies something for me, okay? When we want to look at, well, what does culture think we should be now? And we say, well, based upon what I'm experiencing now, this is what I believe that's dangerous. It's a scheme of the devil, and it leads people to deconversion, and it does not lead them to a deepening faith, a deepening life, or a deepening spiritual experience. It will not lead you there when you do that, okay? As a child, I did not take my toys apart to destroy them. I took them apart so I could learn how they worked and maybe improve upon the design, okay? So I'd like to cover a few reasons why people are deconstructing their faith. Is that all right? This next part is going to be very vulnerable. It's going to be very transparent. It's going to hit some hot topics. It may stir up a wound in you. I pray that it doesn't. I pray that we can have this conversation and maybe have some healing as we deconstruct our faith and find out the things that need to be healed and the things that need to be forgiven. The number one reason why people are deconstructing their faith is because of church hurt. Church hurt. Church hurt. Something has happened. They're questioning what they believe because they were hurt by a pastor, they were hurt by leadership, or they were hurt by someone sitting next to them in church. Maybe they were part of a connect group or a small group, and maybe they were vulnerable one day and told somebody something that they're dealing with or they're working through or that they need healing with, and the next thing you know, someone spread gossip about them and put the rumor through the church, and now they're hurt. That stuff is very real. Listen, it's important for us to say church hurt is real. But it is also important to understand legitimate church hurt versus simple disagreement you don't have to agree with every sermon I preach. You don't have to like every sermon I preach. You don't really even have to like me all that much. But has God called you to assemble in a community of believers? You get what I'm saying? And people leave church over things that have nothing to do with the church of God itself. Well, I don't know, our personalities don't gel. What does our personalities have to do with us growing in the faith of God? Like, like, we've put our personal preference over doing what Scripture says to do as a body of believers, as a kingdom. I mean, doggone, we're going to be stuck in heaven for eternity with each other. You got to figure it out. Hmm. Some people don't want to grow in the unity of love and... Many people are leaving church not because of the bi biblical concepts, but just because they don't like the person sitting next to them. I can't believe the church lets people like that in here. I don't want to sit next to those kind of people. Come on, somebody. I got to go to a church that protects me from them. Who protects people from you?
There is legitimate church hurt. There is abuse of power. There is leading with anger and manipulation. There is control. There's ungodly character. Those things are real, and when they happen, it can cause people to be hurt, and it can cause people to leave the faith completely. I have hurt people. I have hurt people with my leadership. I have hurt people with mistakes that I've made. I've hurt people with my words. I've hurt people because I didn't know the scripture like I know it now back when I preached it 27 years ago. We hopefully, we grow in our faith. We hopefully grow in our EQ, our emotional quotient, that we can understand that, that it's not okay to be angry in the pulpit, that it's not okay to get on social media and blast other believers. Like, that's not okay. That's not what we do. We walk in love and we build the kingdom, right? Like, And I can't apologize for everyone. I can apologize for me if I've hurt you. If, I've hurt, if you're watching online and I've hurt you, like, I'm sorry. Like, I hope that I grow and that I learn from my mistakes. I hope that there wouldn't be people that leave the church and don't say why. Like, like it's not being confrontational to tell me why you're leaving if it was something that we did. So that we can learn and be better. We don't think we're perfect. We think we're pretty darn cool, but we don't think we're perfect. We must understand in a community, we are all flawed humans. But do you know where, where the problem lies when it comes to pastors or priests or whatever? It comes way back from the beginnings of the Catholic Church, the universal church, is when the, the Catholic Church came out and said, well, not only is the priest a human and or ordained by God, but they actually receive grace from God and they receive divination so that when they speak, they are as divine. They are as God. Like God is, they, they can't speak of their own. They can only speak what God says to them and through them. And therefore, if a divine being hurts you, God hurts you. Therefore, I'm out of this faith. And here's the transparent, honest truth. There are times when pastors get into the pulpits and they haven't prayed as much as they should have prayed that week. People get, pastors get up in the pulpits and they haven't read their Bible as much as they should have read their Bible this week. And maybe they behaved in ways that they shouldn't have behaved throughout the week and maybe when they get up on stage they're a little bit more carnal than they should be. And maybe they don't hear from God as clearly as they should and then you hurt people. And I'm sorry that many pastors in this generation today are that human and are that carnal and deal with the, the flesh as much as they do. I would say that you're not in church because you serve a perfect pastor. You must look beyond the human and serve the God of the imperfect pastor. <laughs> Pastors will come and go. But the kingdom of God is at hand. It will remain eternal. <laughs> Number two, people are deconstructing faith because of cultural questions. Cultural questions. Many deconstruct because of the specific cultural moment. Okay? So can we go hot topic? Specific cultural moment. What's the church going to do about LGBTQ+. What are we doing about it? What's your answer for it? How are you going to fix it? Let's talk about that for a second. The only examples that we have in the Bible and things that, we, that fix culture, we have to look back at Jesus himself. Jesus, the anointed one, and his anointing. You know what I love about Jesus? He didn't really fix a darn thing. What are you going to do about this, Jesus? Well, in my kingdom... Foxes have holes and birds have, like, he totally, like, he kind of, like, dodged the question complete, not because he wasn't confronting it. He was saying, you're focusing so much on the temporal, and you're forgetting the eternal. <laughs> but we got questions. Church has questions about science and faith. Can they abide together? Can science and faith abide together? Is the earth 7,000 years, 6,000 years old? Or is the earth billions of years old? We have, we have 
struggles and questions about gender and sexuality, about racial strife. Racial strife. Hey, Pastor Mike, is this a black church? Is this a white church? What kind of church is this? Well, we say we're a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Well, what does diverse mean? You know, I always prided myself. I would tell people that I was in an interracial marriage, and someone corrected me. They said, you're not in an interracial marriage. I'm like, what are you talking about? My wife's Spanish. She's Puerto Rican. Right? And they're like, nope. You're, you're in um, intercultural marriage, but because she got white skin, it's not interracial. I said, well, she's hotter than your wife. <laughs> here's, <laughs> here's what I know. Here's what I know. I don't, I, <laughs> made myself sweat. Here's what I know, man. Like, why are we so discontent with our identity? We ask each other, man, what's your nationality? I'm Irish. I'm Italian. Man, your family's been in America for 99 years. You were born here, but we don't want to identify being American. We want, to, we want to identify with something else. And, like, and I just wonder too, like, none of us identify as a child of God. We more identify with our humanity than we do with our eternity. Here's what I know about my identity. When God looks at me, and I know this seems like this is really easy for a white male preacher to say. <laughs> Actually, it's not. I'm about to get canceled by somebody. <laughs> Here's what I know. When God looks at me, he sees one color. Red, the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Child of God, saint, sanctified, set apart. Now listen, and I'm not even trying to be culturally insensitive. I'm not. I celebrate everyone's heritage, 100%. 100% I celebrate your heritage, I celebrate your history, I celebrate your culture. But when each individual personal culture trumps the culture of the kingdom, we have a problem. We have a problem. When your political views trump the culture of the kingdom, we have a problem. Please don't cancel me over that. Here's what we also have to understand about the cultural situations, is that it's nothing new. It's nothing new. We want to talk about sexuality, how oh, this is crazy, like all these things about sexuality. I mean, let's go back in the Bible, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, it's in the Bible. Like, we have stories of this stuff. Like, the problems that we're having, nothing's new. The dollar, the dollar is going to go away. Oh, my God, man, 40 years ago they were saying the same thing. Like, the, none of the problems that we're going through are new. Maybe the specifics are, but the foundations of the problem are not anything new. Culture is culture. We're trying to figure out how does Christ fit with culture. The Christian faith has answers. If we're willing to go back to the blueprints of the design, go back to the scripture and say, this is where we need to start. We need to build upon this. Number three, the number third reason why people are deconstructing, I've only got a few minutes left, is Christian hypocrisy. Christian hypocrisy. From listening to stories, I would say that the recent uptick in deconversions has really been accelerated by what is seen as Christian hypocrisy. Especially over the last 10 years, there's been this increasing problem, already, when Christians want more than salvation of their enemies, they want power over their enemies. Watch. There's a problem when Christians want power over their enemies instead of the salvation of their enemies. All right, let's just go back to our topic about a subculture. Subculture in society, the LGBTQ plus community. Just God needs to come in and judge them. How come you're not saying, Lord, bless them? Keep them. Make your face shine upon them. 
Make your countenance fill them and give them peace. Speak life and healing to their hearts and the joy of the Lord be their strength. We don't pray for people we don't like. We want power over them. It's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. Let the fruit of the Spirit, not them. Church needs to protect me from people like that. Don't let them sit next to me. Now let people who smell like cigarette smoke sit next to me in church. But man, your pride and arrogance stinks like B.O. Give me a person who smells like stale beer all day, but has joy and loves God over someone who's got perfume and cologne, but stinks. Sour resentment. Come on, somebody. I prayed, I, listen, I prayed that God would give me peace not to attack the Pharisee. I'm just saying. But this is a problem. There is hypocrisy in church. Somebody pointing a finger and judging somebody. Oh, God, help me, Jesus. You're judging people who sin differently than you. The church is judging people. Look at that person. Look at that sin that they're in. God needs to judge this homosexual. But you're 90 pounds overweight. Stop eating a donut. No, I'll just take another statin and everything's okay. I'll just take another blood pressure medication. I'll be all right. No, you're killing yourself and you're, and you're not self-controlled. You're just as in sin. It's hypocrisy. And we're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. Come on. Let's just admit it. We all got problems. We're all flawed. That's why we come together. We say, I'm not perfect. I got mistakes. Can we build this thing together? Can, we, can you help me where I'm weak and I help you where you're weak and where I'm strong? I can. The church has preached against sinful politicians while others claim that Christ has embraced certain political powers at all costs. God's hand is upon this president, but God is not on this president. Come on, give me a break. You don't even know what you're talking about. Listen, can I just say one more thing? Everything you see in the news is a lie. This Christian hypocrisy doesn't look like Jesus. Christian hypocrisy doesn't look like Jesus. And if the world doesn't see Jesus when they see the church, they won't believe in Jesus when the church speaks. You go to a church that's judgmental and nasty, they're not going to lead anybody to the Lord. They're not going to grow. Like, uh, a church that's judgmental and nasty is only going to get other Christians to attend their church. They're never going to get unbelievers to attend their church. Which also means is that their church has a very small growth curve. The person came in knowing a certain level of Christianity, and they're going to end knowing a certain level of Christianity, and they're going to be stuck right there. But they're never going to send disciples out to reach the nations to get the church to grow because they get them stuck right there. We're going to close the door when you come in, but we're definitely not going to let you out. It's not what God's design is. There's a group of people that Jesus was just like disgusted with, and it was the religious hypocrite. The religious hypocrite. Luke 11, 37, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. This scripture has huge implications. I just want to kind of give you an encouraging word here. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. Jesus did not like Pharisees. He did not like him at all. He was literally disgusted by Pharisees. But one asked him, come to my house and have dinner. And what did Jesus do? He went with him. He went with him. Jesus goes anywhere he's invited. Dude, that's huge. Jesus will go anywhere he's invited. What are the implications? If Jesus isn't near you, it's because you haven't invited him. I think sometimes churches have church services and they're like, man, it's just dry. There was like no spirit of God. No one in the whole church invited the boy. Because he'll go... Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. He went through Samaria, Samaria when nowhere else would go because there was someone who needed him. 
he went in and reclined. He was completely at home in the midst of people he didn't like because he had love. He loved them. So watch. This Pharisee, watch this, verse 38. The Pharisee was astonished to see that Jesus didn't first wash before dinner. Come over to my house and have dinner. Jesus sits down. Wait! You didn't wash your hands. What's wrong with you? Some kind of sin you got in your life? You won't wash your hands before dinner? Jesus said to him, now the Pharisees clean, clean, cleanse the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Man, you just done set your boy off. He don't stop. He just goes, right? He says, you fools, did, <laughs> did not he who made the outside of the dish make the inside also? But give his alms to those things that were within, and behold, everything is clean for you. He says, get cleaned inside, and then everything else is clean. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and love of God. So you just, you're so nasty to people and you're so mean to people, but you think because you put a dollar in the plate, you're good. He says, these ought not to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. You're sitting up in the front. Woe to you, for you're like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. You're in the front of the church, you're, you're, you're greeting people on the streets, and nobody even knows you're a Christian. Because there's no fruit. The Bible says they will know you by your fruit, but there's no fruit. He keeps going. One of the lawyers says to him, teacher, when you say these things about the Pharisees, man, you're insulting me too. Jesus says, woe to you lawyers, <laughs> for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch these burdens with a finger. You make laws that no one can follow, and you don't even follow them. Jesus, in one passage, deconstructed the whole Pharisee faith. Deconstructed it says there's broken pieces, there's problems with its design. We need to build it in a better way on better promises. Here's the big idea today. Jesus did not cancel these people for being hypocrites. He brought correction. He did not bring cancel culture. He brought correction culture. We're in cancel culture today. I don't like what you said. I'm blasting all over social media and I'm ruining your life. Jesus didn't do that. He, came, he brought face-to-face -face correction culture. We're going to correct this. We're going to build this properly. We're, we're, we know that we have mistakes. We know that we have problems. We know that there's things going on. And, and you know what? We're going to work on that so we can build something healthy that can last for generations. Jesus deconstructs wrong belief, even to its core of hypocrisy, but he still didn't cancel his audience. I'm all in for deconstruction as long as it serves a purpose to reconstruct with biblical truth at its core. A few months ago, I was studying a passage of scripture where it says that Isaac went to the land of his father Abraham. Abraham had tons of property, tons of land, and as he would travel, he would have the men dig wells so that they could drink from them, they could feed their cattle, their herds, and all these things. But over time, you know, they stopped using those lands or whatever, and they would just fill the holes in. And it says in, that Isaac went to the land of his father, and he re-dug the wells of his father. It says he re-dug the wells, and he drank from them, and he was nourished. There's some things in our lives that we need to go, like our parents weren't all wrong. There's some things, there's some great values and some great systems and some great foundations that our parents taught us that we need to go back and revisit. But in those wells, Isaac first had to remove the contaminants because there were some things that got thrown in, there's some garbage that got thrown into those wells. There's some things that we got thrown in there that we thought were scriptures that aren't scriptures, that there are ways that we we're supposed to act as a Christian that really weren't in scripture. You see, 
you got to return, you got to get rid of the contaminants out of the water before you can be nourished by that water. We got to clean some things up about our faith. We got to clean some things up about our beliefs before we can drink from the springs of life and be nourished from them. We got to purify some of these things. Wash them up. Why? So that we have a future in our faith. I'm telling you, man, the Christian faith is under attack like never before. There are not more people searching for God today than there were 10 years ago. It, it's just not. People don't feel like they need church. They, don't feel, they feel like they don't need God. Why? Because there's no benefit to it. They've got to find the benefit to it. And we're the example of it. I'm going to go one step further. If, if, if Christians are the light of the world, they are the example, they are, they are the salesmen to Christianity, but you're sad all the time, you're angry all the time, you're depressed all the time, why would someone want to be like you? Why would someone believe that you have the answer and your life's the absolute wreck? No, people are drawn to success. People are drawn to love. People are drawn to joy. People are drawn to laughter. I posted a picture on social media a few days ago of Jesus like doing this belly laugh and I just thought to myself, man, when's the last time you had a really good laugh? When's the last time you had like deep belly laughs with your best friends where you couldn't even contain it anymore? That's the joy of the Lord that we should have as Christians. Deconstruction. I'm all for it. If we're going to build something better. Can we build the relationship with God and the faith that he designed for us that fuels us and feeds us and brings healing and wholeness? Let me pray. Father, I thank you today that your word is alive and powerful and sharp than the two-edged sword. I pray, God, that I didn't say anything today that caused another church hurt. I pray that we would just be able to ask why questions in an intellectual, safe environment and not be emotionally driven about things that anger us. God, let us have one thing that angers us and it's sin. If we can get angry at sin and love God more than anything else, then God, we could change this world for you. I pray, Lord, that the peace of God would reign richly in our hearts and in our minds. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, if you've been able to start this journey with him to even start on the foundation of faith, we want to offer Jesus to you today. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you are saved. You have access to eternal life in Jesus. After you take that step, I would say sign up for the next water baptism. That's your next step after that. But if you're here today and you've not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, or you're watching online and you've not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd like to offer this to you right now by praying this prayer. And it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah. Father, we thank you that this word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish what you set it forth to do. I pray, God, that you bring healing and hope and maybe some great conversations, God, about... Here's my hope, God, that if there's a family whose child is struggling with their identity, this series would spark a conversation that would bring healing to that home. That, Father, we would not lose our children from anger or, or, or things that, or the way that we've been taught or that we would be raised. But God, there could be healing in our homes. I pray this week, God, if there's that person who's maybe watching this online at a later time and they've found themselves far from you, they would feel the Holy Spirit call them back home. Lord, to that person, Lord, to that person who lost a family member this year, and by losing that family member, they've lost faith in you, I pray that this week you would minister healing to their heart, that you would let them know that you've never left them, 
You've never forsaken them, that you're as close to them as a brother. Speak that healing to their heart. Lord, I thank you and I praise you that you are a gracious God. Your mercies are new every morning. You love us just the way we are. I thank you for that. We love you for that. And you love us so much that you want to perfect us and bring us closer and bring us from grace to grace and mercy to mercy. As we leave here, let our hearts be healed, let our hearts be full of joy. Let our families have open dialogues and conversations that bring wholeness to our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark. And if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started.